There's always been a duality to One Piece, one that built successfully on its predecessors in shonen manga, especially the incomparable Dragon Ball series. That duality is the balance between the serious and the silly. That balance is present to some degree in all shonen action series, even more intense manga like Attack on Titan have some elements of Levi T. Oh, levity. Whatever. A good example is... <laughs> Soga King is a hilarious masked hero character and also the basis for an important character development arc for Usopp. The serious and the silly play off each other to elevate a character and give him some much needed depth. But there are other elements to the Soga King story, too. It follows the heart-rending fight between Luffy and Usopp over the fate of the going Mary, a clash of values over how best to respect and honor the Mary. Luffy wanting to retire her and Usopp willing to put it all on the line to keep her. Usopp fought harder than anyone would have expected, but still lost. He'd been grappling with his weakness for a while, well before Water 7 and earlier in the arc with the Frankie family, his defeat against Luffy brought him around to his evolution into Soga King. Usopp's story here is a microcosm of Luffy's story. Aside from specific foreshadowing about Nika and Joy Boy, there are two threads across One Piece that lead into that, the clash of wills and the need to match will with power. Part 1. The Clash of Wills the importance of will gets brought up a lot in One Piece, whether it's inherited will passed down from parents or mentor figures, or conquers hockey as a burst of concentrated willpower enough to knock out anyone weak-willed enough in the vicinity. And the battle of wills has gone all the way back to everyone's favorite red-nosed clown. Buggy and the fight against him is a relic of the old romance dawn one-shot. There were two types of pirates back in that one shot, Peace Mains and Morganias, with Proto Luffy being a Peace Main and the villain called Galley being a Morganian. It was centered around the idea that there were two ways to be a pirate one who sought freedom, bad guys who liked to loot and plunder. You'll pay for this, Captain Planet! And that's the simple clash of wills that starts everything out with Luffy versus Buggy. Buggy's a pretty one-note guy at the end of the day, though he plays that note hilariously when he returns to the plot and Impel Down and Beyond. But Buggy being a basic ne'er-do-well starts us off on this journey, Luffy fighting against the kind of pirate that he doesn't want to be. Kuro and Krieg are pretty one-note too, but also define what Luffy isn't. Kuro's grand scheme is all fixated on running away from the pirate life, betraying his crew, betraying Kaya and her family, destroying the whole community of Syrup Village that took him in, all because he needed to run away from the bounty on his head from the government. Krieg takes advantage of others, needing to seize the Barati instead of just taking their generosity, abusing his loyal crewman Gein to try and gain an edge in the fight against Luffy. The man abused an offer of food. Food! For Arlong, and also for Hody Jones and Doflamingo, you can take a look at my old video, and sorry about any first video rough edges to it, because that video goes through what they represent specifically. I'll link in the description below to the time in the video when I discuss them. In three phrases, it's Arlong with the cycle of revenge, Hody Jones with fascism and organized hate, and Doflamingo with totalitarianism. Wapo has a bit of the same evil Luffy fights against Don Krieg with, except instead of abusing his subordinates and the hospitality of others, he's abusing the trust of his kingdom, exploiting his citizens for his own gain and then ditching them as soon as Blackbeard came along, leaving them to defend themselves and only coming back to pick up the pieces when the coast was clear, coincidentally right as the Straw Hats arrived. To skip a little bit ahead, Foxy is also in that Krieg Wapple category. All three of them are contrasts to how Luffy treats his allies and his crew. While Krieg abuses hospitality in his crew, and Wapple exploits and neglects his citizens, and is soon directly contrasted by Vivi and Cobra as royals who will do anything for their people, Foxy sees his crew as disposable in a different way. 
Not so much that he's willing to hurt or kill them to get ahead, but he's willing to risk them as members of his crew, trade them away like he's a Pokemon trainer. And that contrast is played up before the Straw Hats even leave the island when they stand up for Robin against Aokiji. But I'm going to cut back to Crocodile for a second, who's really the first big test of Luffy's mettle. Crocodile's a huge jump up in power compared to Wapple and the others. And you get a taste of the kind of power you're dealing with in Zoro's ill-fated duel with Mihawk, another one of the Shichibukai. With that and Crocodile's seemingly untouchable elemental power of the Sand Sand Logia fruit, he's also more than just a dispossessed king of a small kingdom or a pirate captain. He's a whole secret society scheming across multiple islands, elite agents as strong as any of the main villains Luffy's fought so far. Crocodile's role in the story is as a walking reality check. It's not just the big leap in power and the reach of his organization, but also how he chooses to use them. He's after the ancient superweapon Pluton, which we later learn is a, like a giant, heavily armed ship capable of wiping entire islands off the map. Crocodile is looking to use this power to overthrow the Alabasta Kingdom and make himself into a world superpower. He had once dreamed of being Pirate King himself, but then got smacked sideways by Whitebeard once in a trip to the New World. After having his dreams crushed, he decided to pay it forward and destroy the dream of the Nefertari family to be good rulers to their people, and destroy Luffy's dream of being Pirate King for good measure. Luffy's triumph there, still one of the best moments in the entire series, wasn't just about him finding a will and a way to punch a sand logia, it was about him proving that he could overcome a new league of power without having to compromise on his own ideals, and he could defend Vivi and her loyalty to her people. Enel's evil isn't what he wants, it's how he's going to get there. Luffy wants to go to the top of the pirate world and be the freest man on the sea. Enna lives in the sky and wants to go even higher. All the way to the moon, baby! Leading up to their fight, Luffy goes through the confrontation with Bellamy in his meeting with Cricket. The mockery both of them endured at Bellamy's hands and the odd encouragement he gets from Blackbeard. Luffy goes through a lot to reach Skypea, the ruins of Chandra and the Golden Bell but what he doesn't do along the way is push anyone down to get there. Enel has an ambitious dream, but he's all too happy to crush any, everyone underfoot to make it. Enemies, allies, and bystanders alike. Rob Lucci and CP9 as a whole are where One Piece gets political. Now, it was never shy about wearing its heart on its sleeve up to that point, like the allegory of the Shandians being Native Americans and forced through a similar plight to real-world First Nations is about as subtle as a sledgehammer, but Water 7 and Eni's lobby are the point where Luffy and the crew can no longer ignore the in-universe politics or the world government. You had a few crooked marines like Morgan or the aptly named Nezumi, but also decent ones like Smoker, the aspiring Kobe and Helmeppo. But the general portrayal of the Marines up to that point was more like you got a few bad apples, a few good apples, but on the balance, as far as the Straw Hats are concerned, they're more an obstacle than an enemy. With CP9 and Spandom, however, it brings out the idea that the world government and the Marines can be a force for evil. The cutthroat ethos of dark justice or necessary evil that Rob Lucci goes along with is a convenient excuse to allow him to get sadistic with those who break the law. While other servants of the WG don't get quite as trigger-happy as Lucci himself, their view of absolute justice that goes up to a kainu implicates all of them in the greed and tyranny of the world government. Being an outlaw, morality isn't that simple for Luffy. He can't just rely on a written code of law to tell him who it's okay to beat up. He has to use his head and his heart. This doesn't mean Luffy always gets it right, biggest example being him letting a ton of bad people out of Impel down in his desperate quest to save Ace. But it forces him to engage with the people around him, forge his own sense of morality. CP9 also represents government oppression by, via their insistent effort to capture Robin. Luffy had the choice to just let Robin go and the Straw Hats would have been able to get away, but he and the crew insisted on standing with her, and that was how they ended up in the line of fire. CP9 and the world government demonize Robin as the survivor of Ohara, and the Straw Hats refused to let them. 
Gecko Moria represents fear of death and fear of loss. His career followed the same trajectory as Croco Boy's, but it was Kaido that tuned him up in the New World instead of Whitebeard, and the one significantly less merciful than the other. Crocodile's defeat is fuzzy on the details, but for Moria it's made clear that his old crew was wiped out. Moria casts that same fear over the crew and his other victims. By taking their shadows, he makes them vulnerable to the sunlight, traps them running through the shadows on Thriller Bark to hide from the daylight and from his zombie hordes. Luffy, Zoro, Sanji, Robin, and Brooke were directly confronted with the fear of death and fought through it. Big Mom runs in the tradition of Foxy, Wapple, and Krieg in being a question of loyalty. Short story is that Big Mom's an abusive parent in a similar way that Foxy and Krieg were abusive captains, and Wapple an abusive king. It plays a bit differently in the story, though, mainly because while Luffy is a captain to contrast with Krieg and Foxy, or his work with Princess Vivi is a contrast with King Wapple, Luffy isn't a parent, as much as a certain pirate empress might want it. Where Luffy comes in is by demonstrating what these relationships should be, such as how he and the others that come with him to Totland put themselves through great danger for Sanji's sake, even as Sanji tries to push them away. What Luffy brings back to Totland is an example of selfless love that strengthens the bonds of the Charlotte family, compared to Big Mom who strains them by terrorizing her children and demanding their success in her schemes as a Yonko. Luffy also brings this out in his fight with Katakuri. After their fight, when Katakuri talks with Brule, you see a warmer and more equal relationship shine through between the siblings. This brings us forward to Kaido, but that itself strings us towards the back half of this video. To get to part two, all that needs to be said about Kaido is that he is about power above all else, seeing it as an end rather than as a means. To become a force for domination and destruction, that will only lead in death, his own and anyone else who gets in his way. Kaido has great will and great power, but he confuses these as one and the same. Part 2. Will and Power Before I get back to Kaido, I'm going to take a trip back to the beginning again, and the first gut punch that One Piece ever pulled, Chocho. I really hope I'm pronouncing that right. For those who don't remember the far-off Orange Town arc, Chocho was the pooch of a local shopkeeper who defended his master's shop. Rain or shine and against the <clears throat> power of the buggy pirates. Yeah, I get it, but he's just a dog, and not even one of those power dogs like Koma Inu or the dog that Mr. Four made into a bazooka. Chocho was one of the first examples of someone having great will, but little to no power. I mean, Kobe was really the first, but Cho Cho's the one with, again, that emotional gut punch that really drives the point home. Cho Cho shows the limits of the real shonen superpower. Not the power of friendship, but sheer force of will. Really, it's a superpower that goes past shonen anime, given the power of miracles through shoujo and magical girls, and really just that, if you'll forgive me for going full weeb for a second, GANBARE! spirit that runs through so much of Japanese pop media. Willpower makes the world go round, it drives the protagonist forward. But for as idealistic as One Piece is, and for as many times as it does rely on that old-fashioned little engine that could spirit, Oda does take pains to highlight that sheer will cannot get you everywhere. That sometimes you hit the wall, you hit it hard. And those moments are some of the most poignant in One Piece, outside of the the infamous tearjerker backstories like Brooks or Robbins. Vivi I've touched on before, who desperately wanted to save her kingdom, her whole kingdom, and led to an early point of character growth for Luffy when they confront each other before the final fight in Alubarna, with Luffy forcing her to accept that they probably aren't going to be able to save Alabasta without at least some deaths. The Luffy-Usopp fight back from the beginning of this video is another part of it, Usopp realizing his own limits and how he can't defend the things that are meaningful to him, despite wanting to save the Mary as much or more than Luffy wanted to move on. Getting closer to the current story, you have the backstory in real time of Pedro. 
Now, Pedro's kind of a mixed bag in that he really was like a real-time backstory character marked for death from the first. He's all fired up about prophecy, about seeing the dawn of the new world that the minks have been looking forward to, but he was fated not to see it. In a desperate attempt to get his friends away from Perro Sparrow, he made the ultimate sacrifice and got nothing out of it. He was a death seeker, but he was also simply not up to the task, despite his tremendous will to see the new dawn. Leading into Wano proper, Momonosuke himself is a great example. Here you have an eight-year-old child with the full weight of destiny thrust onto his shoulders, and much of his character arc is about him finding the will to fill his father's shoes, sandals, geta, you get the point. Anyway. Momonosuke's arc up through Onigashima itself is about him finding his willpower, and his moments early on in the raid are a climax to that arc, especially when he has been chained up at the main stage with King, Queen, and Kaido himself, but proudly stands by his father and by the land of Wano and his desire to protect it. But as the arc goes on and he gets his chance with Kaido directly, he understands that the task is beyond him, that willpower alone isn't enough to go up against Kaido. So he makes the sacrifice of his childhood, or what was left of his childhood after the trauma road roller his life's been since Kaido showed up. He had Shinobu age him up to adulthood so that he could use the full power of his smile fruit and do what he had the will, but not the power to do, to protect his people. Part 3. Nika. This brings us back to Nika. There's been some praise for Nika and some criticism. Two points of attack are, one, that Nika's Looney Tunes style of combat and goofy cartoon superpowers are unfitting, and for that one, what manga have you been reading this whole time? The second criticism is that Nika kind of comes out of nowhere, which is a criticism with more meat on its bones. This essay responds to both of those critiques. And as I write this, I'm wondering if I wrote this whole script ass backwards, but whatever. Let's look at these two criticisms now, in light of everything else I've talked about for the last 18-ish minutes. 3A. This is corny. Set aside for a moment One Piece's nature as a borderline gag manga, where there's always been a lot of what TV tropes calls the rule of funny, or if it's funny, it works, and there's no need to question or explain it further. Instead, you can look at Nika's goofiness in light of the battle of wills that's been going on throughout the entire story so far. A lot of those battles are more highlighted the thing that Luffy stood against rather than what Luffy stood for. What Luffy stood for has been pretty consistent. The power of friendship, regardless of how long he's been friends with the person or animal in question, and his dream of being king of the pirates, which he sees as being the freest man on the sea. But most of the arcs don't really flesh out Luffy directly in opposition to the lead villain of that arc. Like how Whole Cake Island doesn't involve Luffy's family at all, while the abusive family dynamic of the Charlottes and of the Vinsmokes are on full display. It isn't often that Luffy is directly contrasted with his opponent and what he stands for. His clash with the villains is usually incidental. The main exception is probably Doflamingo, who is focused on total control compared to Luffy's quest for freedom. Luffy's awakening as Nika is him fully realizing what he wants to be. Freewheeling, goofy, endlessly inventive in combat. The legend of Nika also fits with Luffy being true to himself the god of the enslaved, the symbol of freedom that Luffy represents. 3b. This came out of nowhere. Nika coming out of nowhere has more merit than the first critique. The biggest hole is that there has not been a devil fruit that's been misrepresented so far. The secret nature of the gum gum fruit was never hinted at. The gears were big changes in how the fruit operated for sure, but we saw novel applications of other fruits too like how Wapple's fruit can make a new kind of metal alloy in a cover story, and that metal alloy has become standard use in high-end weaponry in the One Piece world. But Oda hasn't said, oh, this is the alchemy alchemy fruit, not the munch munch fruit. No, it's just novel application for a pretty mundane fruit idea. 
Mika himself wasn't revealed until Who's Who's exposition dump during his fight with Jinbei. And there would have been an easy place to put him in when talking about Fisher Tiger as a more modern liberator and symbol of hope to enslaved peoples. On the other hand, you have allusions to Joy Boy going all the way back to Skypea, so that's a point in Nika's favor. Yet here we are. In chapter 1046, Kaido says that awakening is what happens when your body and mind catch up with your powers, and that supports what I'm saying here in this essay. Luffy's Gear 5, the Nika Awakening, is the ideal use of his powers. His will was always to be the freest man on the sea. That was his dream for piracy as far back as childhood. But will and power are two separate things in the story. It's not enough to want something, even with every fiber of your being. You have to have the physical ability to go for it. For Luffy, Nika is will and power coming together as one after over 1,000 chapters of seeking his dream and building his combat power. Nika is Luffy, fully realized. To wrap it up, One Piece's villains all stand for something that Luffy's worldview is opposed to. Morganian piracy, cowardice, disloyalty of a few stripes, the cycle of vengeance, crushing dreams, megalomania, government oppression, fear of loss, hatred and bigotry, total control, and sheer power. In contrast, Luffy's always stood for freedom, loyalty, and facing danger head on. But in One Piece, you've always needed physical power to back up what you believed in. Luffy's had to stop and build himself up before, and others in the series forced to confront their inability to match their will with power. Nika brings will and power together for Luffy, and is a perfect endgame power for him. Smile fruits have something to do with this too, but we'll see. Thank you all again for watching my video. Be sure to like, subscribe, and follow me on Twitter at below left. This will be my first video using DaVinci Resolve, so... Hopefully this turned out good. Cheers, y'all.